y'all were positively begging for it over on Instagram. So here it is, my loves. All of the first tier of the super long unexplained mystery iceberg piled into a single video. Now you can finally listen to it as you fall asleep so you can have nightmares or whatever it is you plan to do with it. If you're new here, welcome. As you can see, I have a decent microphone here, but about three quarters of this video were recorded with a cheap poo-poo microphone I had before I bought this one. It sucks, I know. So without further ado, here's tier one. Did Wikipedia correctly predict a homicide? Chris Benoit was a Canadian pro wrestler who took the lives of his wife and son before hanging himself in their home outside Atlanta in 2007. The exact reasoning is unknown, but many suspect behavioral changes due to prolonged steroid use or CTE brain damage. The same type of brain damage that football players get from repeated head injuries. But that's not the mystery. No, the mystery is that an anonymous edit to his Wikipedia page managed to predict the crime in advance. On the afternoon of June 23, 2007, Benoit informed fellow wrestler Chavo Guerrero that he would not be able to make it to that night's wrestling event in Texas because his family had bad food poisoning. He further explained that he would be on the next flight out the following morning. Around 4 a.m. June 24th, Benoit sent a series of text messages to co-workers, including Guerrero, stating that his dogs would be closed in the fenced-in pool area in his backyard and that his garage would be left open. Later that morning, Benoit informed WWE that he would be taking an afternoon flight to Houston for that night's event, which he never made it to. On June 25th, WWE officials were beginning to grow concern that they had not heard from Benoit in over 24 hours and he was doing an event that night in Corpus Christi. At this point, Guerrero recalls the cryptic texts he received in the early morning hours and he shares them with WWE officials. At this point, WWE decides to call the police to perform a welfare check at Benoit's Atlanta area home. The bodies were discovered by police at around 4 p.m., after which they inform WWE. Here's where it gets weird, though. 14 hours prior to the discovery of the bodies, Chris Benoit's Wikipedia page was updated to include mention of his wife's passing. The same IP address ended up being linked to vandalism of numerous other accounts by an anonymous poster. After a thorough investigation, it was determined that this poster was in no way related to the crime and charges were dropped. The poster described the incident as a huge coincidence and nothing more. What was that tall, lanky creature you saw in the woods? Let's talk about crawlers, baby. Crawlers are classified as a cryptid by the chart, but typing in crawlers cryptid into Google pulls up a ton of results about Fresno night crawlers, which I love dearly, but that's not what we're talking about. The first substantial thing I came across was a subreddit called r slash crawler sightings. The subreddit describes crawlers as having pale skin, long limbs, and standing at around eight feet tall. The description then goes on to mention that the crawler was the inspiration behind fictional characters such as Slenderman and The Rake. I can't really find any reference to crawlers, earlier than 2005 when the rake was invented on 4chan. From what I've seen, people are claiming to have had actual encounters with them, even outside of their supposed North American habitat. As far as I'm concerned, they're just the stereotypical creepy thing in the woods and kind of serve as an umbrella category for any tall, pale humanoid. What's at the center of a black hole? It's the cosmic censorship hypothesis. Down here. Space can be scary sometimes. And this is one of those times. This gets into some pretty complicated stuff like quantum mechanics, so forgive me if I'm wrong about any of it. This is just the best and most concise understanding I could come to after a few hours of research. Feel free to politely provide corrections in the comments. The cosmic censorship conjecture was proposed by Roger Penrose in 1968 and states that no naked singularities exist in the universe, based on Einstein's theory of general relativity. According to Wikipedia, a singularity is a condition in which gravity is predicted to be so intense that space-time itself would break down catastrophically. For the point of this video, think of a singularity as the tiny theoretical point at the center of a black hole, and think of the event horizon as the outer edge of the black hole where things start to get kind of weird. A naked singularity would hypothetically be one that does not have an event horizon. The cosmic censorship hypothesis theorizes that all singularities are contained within an event horizon and therefore they cannot be observed independently. However, there seems to be a lot of debate as to whether singularities even exist or if they're kind of just the blind spot at the outer limits of an equation. And if not, what is at the center of a black hole? Essentially, we don't know and we may never find out. Because like I said, space can be scary. 
Are the secrets of the universe hiding in your junk emails? Spam and see. While this may sound like a form of necromancy performed on a can of spam, that is not remotely what it is. And if you didn't think that, don't say anything. Spamancy is the concept of divining meaning from the content of your junk emails, essentially allowing your subconscious, the universe, what have you, to communicate via the perceived randomness of spam. Another version of this would be to click the random page button on Wikipedia and apply the contents of the article to your life. My first try at this without a specific question in mind brought me to the page of a Spanish serial killer, so I don't know what that means. For my second try, I went in with the question about my love life, and it brought me to the page for a song titled, I've been lonely too long, so <laughs> Wikipedia's got jokes. It has been compared to bibliomancy, which is the idea of turning a book to any random page and divining meaning from the text. I have also heard of the same concept being applied to songs that come on the radio and sitting in public and picking out little bits of overheard conversation and applying the meaning to your life. Did the Roman Empire actually exist? If you've been on TikTok a while, this might sound familiar. This theory was proposed by user Mom Millennial, and you may recall her being dunked on mercilessly a couple years ago. Her main claim was that things like Hadrian's Wall and other ruins were not built by the Romans. Another claim was that there are no primary texts left from the Roman Empire, which is just factually incorrect, and that the Spanish Inquisition just made the whole thing up. And by the whole thing, I mean the literal Roman Empire. She later backtracked, claiming that she meant all of this metaphorically. I'm not sure anyone besides her actually ever believed this theory. Something new for the boys to think about. Are you more likely to see a ghost if you already believe in them? The sheep goat effect. The term sheep goat effect was coined by scientist Gertrude Schmedler in her study of ESP or extrasensory perception. She defined sheep as people who believe in ESP and goats as people who do not. But this phenomenon can be extrapolated to the paranormal as a whole. Subjects were tested on their ability to perform ESP-related tasks, such as identifying a hidden shape or color. The control group was just completely random chance. As anticipated, sheep scored above the control group and goats scored below. Is this just an example of confirmation bias? Were their subconscious beliefs somehow influencing the outcome of the experiment? Or are you more likely to experience paranormal events if you're more receptive to the concept? Did the robber barons of the past get rich by studying the occult? Wall Street Witchcraft. This is most likely in reference to a book by the same title written by Max Gunther that explores the occult side of the stock market. Numerous people have seemingly found success investing with techniques such as astrology, tarot cards, and psychics. You may have even heard the quote, millionaires don't use astrology, billionaires do, attributed to JP Morgan. While he did have a genuine interest in the occult, he probably didn't say that. He did, however, have a personal astrologer on call to advise him about planets and their effect on politics in the stock market. His personal astrologer, Evangeline Adams, gained her notoriety from correctly predicting a hotel fire in New York in 1899. And there are actually quite a few conspiracy theories revolving around J.P. Morgan, astrology, and the Titanic, including the theory that his personal astrologer predicted that it would sink and that's why he was not aboard. That could be several videos on its own. Who Built the Moon? Best I can tell, this is based on a book called Who Built the Moon by Christopher Knight. Good night, moon. Good night, spoon. There also seemed to be a website called whobuiltthemoon.com, but I couldn't get it to load. The book itself presents a lot of coincidences and circumstantial evidence to try and prove its point that the moon did not just form naturally. Not in like a creationism way, but more in like a humans traveled back in time to geoengineer the moon from a chunk of Earth way. And because it wouldn't be a conspiracy theory without them, this does somehow relate to the Freemasons. I am extremely disappointed I could not get on that website. Have you seen this man? Stick man. It's a cryptid or entity that is literally just a living stick figure. Witnesses allege that the stick man is two-dimensional, impossibly tall, completely silent, and it just walks all bouncy like a silly, goofy guy. <laughs> also that it makes the air feel staticky and like there was a sudden drop in barometric pressure. While witnesses do report feeling extreme dread, they don't actually seem to be hostile. They seem to be mostly curious and maybe somewhat shocked that somebody can actually see them. The leading speculation online is that they're just multidimensional beings here to explore. 
so keep an eye out for this guy next time you're alone in a dark alley. Could you live inside a black hole? So theoretically, yes, a black hole could sustain life under a very specific set of circumstances. So first of all, it would need to be rotating pretty much as fast as physically possible in order for a planet to sustain a stable orbit. And we're not going to even worry about how the planet got there. And it would need to be a massive enough black hole that you wouldn't be stretched out into spaghetti by the gravitational difference. Oh, and because of time dilation, one year could feel like thousands. All the comforts of home, right? When are you moving? What is the government hiding? Well, presumably a lot of things. Andrew DiBasaggio is a lawyer, journalist, former presidential candidate, and self-proclaimed planetary whistleblower. He claims to have been a participant in a government project called Project Pegasus, studying time travel and teleportation as a child. And Obama was there. And I don't want to go much further because this is just like an actual guy that could show up in my comments at any moment. But if you want interviews with him, they're pretty easy to find. I found him on LinkedIn. We love a good secret society. The Nine Unknown was originally a novel published by Talbot Mundy in 1923 about a secret society intended to protect and preserve knowledge that could be dangerous if it fell into the wrong hands. The knowledge in question is mainly occult in nature, you know, alchemy, transmutation, what have you. A later book in the 1960s called Morning of Magicians claims that the Nine Unknown, the secret society, were a real thing that was actually established by Emperor Ahsoka in 270 BC in what would later become India. But the main point of this being on the iceberg is that some people think this secret society still exists in some form. An ancient empire obscured from records? Eh. This is a conspiracy theory that seems to be based primarily on a very narrow, western-centric view of world history. It seems to be mainly based on architecture in the Beaux Arts style that seems anachronistic or in some way out of place. Think architectural styles that were imported by colonizers. Many of the buildings in question only exist in photographic records because they were demolished in the early 1900s or they were buried in a giant mudslide. And that this is all because they were built by some mysterious ancient empire that was completely covered up for whatever nefarious reason. And then it sort of starts to drift into giants were real territory, and I'm not going to go any further into it because it gets really anti-Semitic from here. Have you ever thought of something only to receive an ad for it later that day? You didn't Google it, you didn't text your friend about it, you didn't say anything about it out loud, you just thought it silently inside your head. So why are you suddenly getting ads about it? Theoretically, advertising algorithms are so advanced that when they track you throughout the internet, they can basically create such an accurate profile of you that they can recreate your thought patterns. That's already plenty unsettling, but I'm sure a lot of us have had experiences with this that seem to defy all logic. I've had a dream before that was interrupted by an ad for Domino's Pizza. I want to hear your stories in the comments. Have you heard a story about a group of hikers experiencing strange symptoms before being reported missing and then later found dead on a mountain in Russia? Do you think I was talking about the Dyatlov Pass incident? Because I'm not. Kamar Daban is a mountain range located near Lake Baikal in Siberia. In early August of 1993, a group of seven hikers would enter and only one would make it back out. The group consisted of a hiking instructor who was 41 years old and known for her tough love survivalist approach as well as her six students in their late teens and early 20s. The instructor was very familiar with the area and the hike was considered generally safe during the summer. They set out with the intention of meeting up with a second hiking group on the third day of their trip. On that third day, when the second group arrived at their designated meeting spot to find that they were alone, they assumed that the first hiking group was delayed by a rainstorm the previous night, so they continued with their hike without any concerns. Almost a week later, one of the students from the first hiking group, named Valentina, was found standing alone in the woods, traumatized and covered in dried blood. When speaking with police, she recounted that early on the third day of their hike, one of her fellow students who was at the back of their group suddenly started screaming. Everyone at the group turned around to see him foaming from the mouth and bleeding from his eyes. The instructor rushed over to help them before quickly succumbing to the same symptoms and falling to the ground convulsing. Another student approached before suddenly clutching at her neck as if she couldn't breathe and then repeatedly bashing her head in against a nearby rock and falling to the ground unconscious. The remaining four split up into two groups and fled the area in a panic. 
two that ran in one direction would end up collapsing, having ripped at their clothes and blood from their mouths. Valentina and the other student ran in the opposite direction, but the student with her would end up collapsing as well. Valentina ran as far as she could from the scene before setting up camp for the night. After several more days of hiking back down the mountain, she would be found by a group of kayakers on August 10th. The bodies of her fellow hikers would not be found until August 24th. The autopsy concluded that the cause of death for the instructor was a heart attack, and the cause of death for all of the other students was... Hypothermia! All of them were found with bruised lungs. Theories range from unintentional exposure to chemical weapons testing to... Aliens. Why does this man cause a traffic jam every time he gets out of prison? The Silent Man, also known as 53-year-old David Hampson of Wales. Ever since 2014, he periodically goes out in front of his town's police station and silently blocks traffic. Mostly by standing in the road. One time by climbing the hood of a mail truck and rolling around on the windshield. Every time he's taken into custody for some form of disorderly conduct, and he refuses to speak about his reasoning. Not to police, not to his attorney, not to the judge, not to psychiatrists, and not to fellow prisoners. At some point, it was legally determined that he was mute out of malice, meaning that he was doing it on purpose and it was not related to any sort of medical condition. He does this immediately after his release every time, so the prevailing theory is that he is homeless and is willingly getting arrested to have three meals and a roof over his head, which is just really sad. I think this meme is going to be a really good way to introduce our topic. Angelology is a mouthful, but it's also the theological study of angels as they appear in the doctrines of Abrahamic religions, where they are typically seen as a conduit between man and God. And it also includes the subset demonology, which is the study of fallen angels. Angelology focuses on breaking down and analyzing all mentions of angels in religious texts, mainly the nature of their existence and their hierarchical structure. As one would expect, there is some variation between different religious sects, with some mainly identifying them by their names or their titles and giving descriptions anywhere from anthropomorphic with wings to our good friends, the intersecting spinning wheels on fire with a ton of eyes. Are you familiar with Canada's most well-documented UFO case? On the chart, this was listed as the gold cigarette incident, but when I was researching it, I found several things that it, like, maybe could have been, so I just picked the one that seemed most relevant to the previous topics. The Falcon Lake incident. Falcon Lake is located in Manitoba and was the site of an alleged 1967 UFO sighting. Stephen Michelak was an amateur geologist who frequented Falcon Lake with the intention of prospecting for precious minerals. While he was bent over to inspect a quartz vein, a flock of geese nearby were startled, causing him to look up. Above him were two cigar-shaped crafts hovering at around 150 feet, or 45 meters for the rest of you. One of the crafts proceeded to land on a nearby rock face where it would remain stationary for over half an hour. After taking the time to sketch it in his notebook, Michelak would curiously approach the craft. Mind you, the entire time he was under the impression that this was an experimental aircraft belonging to the U.S. military. The crafts themselves appeared metallic but lacked any sort of seams or identifying markings, and the air around the craft was noticeably warmer and smelled of sulfur. When he touched the craft, it was hot enough to melt through the fingers of his gloves. Suddenly the craft rotated, revealing a grid-like panel that emitted a blast of superheated gas as the craft took off. Michelak was knocked backwards onto the ground and parts of his clothes were burned away. Immediately after the incident, Michelak felt ill, experiencing dizziness and vomiting. The local doctor was unavailable, so he took a Greyhound bus back home to receive medical care. He was then admitted to the emergency room with a grid-shaped burn pattern on his chest. In the following weeks, Michelak would continue to experience headache, upset stomach, passing out, and rapid weight loss. His symptoms were consistent with radiation poisoning, but medical testing remained inconclusive. Elevated levels of radiation were, however, detected on his clothes from that day, as well as the site at Falcon Lake. Michelak would periodically experience reoccurrence of the grid-shaped burns on his chest until his passing in 1999. Have you ever seen a deer that just looked off? I know they're your favorite, and I know you are so excited right now. The not deer, pause for clapping, is an urban legend endemic to the Appalachian Mountains, and it's exactly what it sounds like. 
It appears to be a normal deer at first glance, but the more you look at it, the more discrepancies you'll find. Its limbs may be slightly too long. Maybe its body is not quite the right shape. Its movements are gangly, like a newborn deer just learning to walk. It's abnormally aggressive, and its eyes point to the front like a predator. They are reportedly not afraid of humans, but don't usually attack unless provoked. I feel like most encounters are reported by hunters or by people seeing them on the side of the road. Skeptics believe that these deer are simply infected with chronic wasting disease or zombie deer. Chronic wasting disease is a prion disorder that affects the central nervous system and causes symptoms similar to the behaviors seen in not deer. Think mad cow disease. Who was the Poe toaster? Every year on Edgar Allan Poe's birthday, from 1949 to 2009, a masked man would enter the Westminster Cemetery in Baltimore in the early morning hours to leave three red roses and a bottle of cognac on his grave. The mysterious mourner was always seen wearing a big hat and all black clothing save for a white scarf. My neighbor is looking at me. It became a tradition for spectators to gather in the distance to watch the mourner pay his respects. Poe never expressed a fondness for cognac, so nobody knows why the toaster chose that. The three red roses are presumed to represent the three people buried at that grave site being Poe, his wife, and his mother-in-law. In 1999, a note was left explaining that the original toaster had died and he was passing the torch to his sons. The sons did not take their toaster duties very seriously, so with crowds dwindling every year, the tradition would eventually draw to a close in 2009. Now the Maryland Historical Society puts on its own toasting ceremony at his grave every year. Have you ever felt someone staring at you? There have been numerous experiments conducted to test the plausibility of whether or not someone can actually sense whether they are being stared at. The first of these experiments was conducted in 1898 by psychologist Edward Titchener when his students were asking questions about the supposed extrasensory perception. The results of his studies essentially amounted to random chance. Multiple experiments have been conducted since then, controlling for different variables and integrating newer technology like video surveillance. Almost all of them reached the same conclusion, with results being no better than chance. However, parapsychologist However, parapsychologist Rupert Sheldrake's experiments in the early 2000s yielded somewhat different results. The large majority of his subjects tested similarly to past experiments, but two of his subjects specifically had a much higher accuracy rate than all the rest. The most common conclusion I've seen is that people who are sensing someone staring at them are actually just subconsciously drawing cues from their peripheral vision or from the environment around them. Is it a meme? Is it a psyop? Is it a new age spiritual thing? It's just what 4chan is up to today. I have a new microphone on the way. Thank you to everyone who pointed me in the right direction for this one. I don't really make a habit of hanging out on 4chan because it's bad for my health. But that's where the cult of the nobody is. The nobody is purported to be some average Joe, but he has extraordinary spiritual powers. Like controlling reality with his mind. And aside from that, he's literally the most average person ever. He wouldn't have any tangible influence or notoriety, and he wouldn't really be aware of his purpose. He would supposedly drift from town to town and job to job, never having any close relationships. He'd be completely unremarkable and not memorable in any way. But for whatever reason, his actions specifically have a ripple effect throughout the entire world, affecting our reality. He would have no idea he's doing this. I can kind of see why the theory is popular, because if you're just some boring guy, I can imagine the appeal of wanting to think you might be the nobody. And now I'm done, because prolonged exposure to 4chan causes your brain to leak out your ears. Picture this. You're a soldier in the Spanish colonial empire, stationed in the Philippines. You blink, and now you're in Mexico. It's 1593, and a soldier named Gil Perez is guarding the governor's palace in Manila. And the governor had literally just been assassinated. Gil Perez starts to feel a bit lightheaded, so he decides to lean against a wall to rest his eyes for a minute. When he opens them again, he's in Mexico City. Everyone's super weirded out that he's in the wrong uniform, and nobody has heard news of the assassination yet. So they throw him in prison for deserting his post and for being in cahoots with the devil. Months later, a passenger on a boat from the Philippines recognizes him and corroborates his story about the assassination. They let him out, and he just goes home. That's it. Workers installing a fence find a mysterious stone egg. In Meredith, New Hampshire, on the shores of Lake Winnipesaukee, the year is 1872. A group of construction workers hired by a local businessman unearth a big ol' stone egg. 
The businessman keeps it, thinking it's a Native American artifact, until after his passing when his family donates it to a museum. The egg is made out of a type of stone that's not native to the area, and it's covered in mysterious symbols. Hey, hey, here's the eggy for your viewing pleasure. It's not the first of its kind, but it is the first to be found in the United States. It has several very neatly drilled holes that appear to have been made with power tools, but the holes have been there the whole time, so that's something. Nobody's positive what purpose it served, anything from a farming tool to a record-keeping device. Some suspect the stone is a hoax that was made in the mid-1800s using one of those, like, hand-crank drills. A common hallucination, or entities from another dimension. I'll have a new microphone next week, don't yell at me. Or I'll get ya! Machine elves are one of the many common archetypes reported by DMT users. Not just in Western cultures, but pretty much universally. DMT is a naturally occurring hallucinogen that produces intense but short-lived visuals. It's in ayahuasca. The elves are seemingly sentient entities that serve as a sort of guide during the trip. They can take on different forms, sometimes humanoid, sometimes shifting fractals, and sometimes just the feeling of a presence. This image by Luke Brown is the general vibe. Interactions are usually positive as they guide the user through the spirit realm and impart their knowledge. There are, however, other entities that can contribute to a more neutral or even negative experience. The website Arrowid is actually a really good resource if you want to do a deep dive into reading about people's personal anecdotes. Who do you want to run off into the woods and find a mystical flower with? Tag them in the comments. But maybe wait till the end of the video so you don't embarrass yourself. The fern flower comes from an Eastern European superstition. Ferns do not actually produce flowers, but for the context of this myth, they do. The flower is said to bloom only on the night of the summer solstice, deep in the woods when the veil is at its thinnest. In different versions of the tale, the person who finds the flower is sometimes granted wealth and prosperity, or maybe supernatural abilities. The flower is supposed to be hard to find due to its location far from civilization, and because it's sometimes guarded by creatures. And when carrying the flower home, you should not turn around and look back. But in other forms of the legend, the flower represents fertility. And going into the woods to look for the fern flower can be a euphemism for couples sneaking off to do... things. Are you real? Am I real? <clears throat> oh my god. Yeah, I'm leaving it in. Sue me. Please don't sue me. The dead internet theory. The theory proposes that at this point, the large majority of internet traffic is comprised of bot activity. With the internet's official death being somewhere between 2016 and 2017. Now most of what happens on the internet is fake. Think of those random accounts that watch your Instagram story and have account names like click here to see my play, or the ones that send you DMs, or those completely unintelligible AI-generated articles that sometimes come up when you Google things. All of that without a shred of human involvement beyond initial setup. Meaning that eventually all organic, human-made content would be drowned out by bot activity. In 2016, a security firm called Imperva released a study that around 52% of internet activity can be attributed to bots. You know it's gotten worse since then. When Elon Musk took over Twitter, or X as I will never call it, it was estimated that around 12% of the accounts were bots, however they can be credited with a much larger percentage of overall activity. Some tech experts estimate that around 2026, 99% of internet activity will be AI. And in a much stranger sense, some of these social media algorithms actually incentivize bot-like behavior, encouraging us to act in repetitive and predictable ways. And I definitely feel that last part whenever I get 50 different comments that all say exactly the same thing. Did you hear a loud noise in the sky on October 20th? When somebody turns around in your driveway and you're like, mysterious aerial sounds. I actually found a super fresh article about an instance of this that happened a few weeks ago, but I want to give you a little bit of background first. As y'all know, unidentified aerial phenomenon have been the talk of the town lately. In recent studies, weather balloons have been recording low-frequency infrasound, inaudible to humans, at around 70,000 feet. After picking out all identifiable sounds, some still defy explanation. Now for what I mentioned earlier. On October 20th, Project Galileo at Harvard picked up some strange sounds on their microphones. The sound was reported throughout New England, with some comparing it to a sonic boom, saying it rattled their windows. And they are actually crowdsourcing reports of the incident at oct20.thegalileoproject.org. So feel free to report anything you actually heard, but please don't go on there and spam random shit. However, this one can most likely be attributed to a meteor shower over Massachusetts. Be so careful next time you find yourself in a dark night club full of Russian oligarchs. 
because I know you do that all the time. Y'all will unfortunately have to endure another week of this microphone because the nice microphone is physically here. It's present, but the cable I got for it is unfortunately unauthorized. So I have to spend $30 and buy the officially licensed one because I love having to spend 30 more dollars to use my $200 microphone. <laughs> do the Russian elite's eyes glow in the dark? Yeah, sure, whatever. This one seems to have originated from this video taken in a Russian nightclub during a power outage. As you can see, when the lights shut off, there are multiple sets of glowing eyes. Now, the most obvious answer would be that those people have on contacts, and there is some very faint light source reflecting off of them. And just to be clear, human eye anatomy does not cause that eye shine that you're used to seeing with some animals. However, a singer that was performing at the nightclub claims to have seen a lot more sets of glowing eyes from the stage. And he says they were glowing green. And of course, the comments on Reddit abound with theories such as aliens, vampires, cyborgs, or some weird stem cell treatment that they've supposedly had. But I think those theories are just trying to tie in adrenochrome because... You know, why not? Or that it's somehow Chernobyl related, but there's no elaboration on what they mean by that. Or maybe they just had on shiny contacts and the singer was drunk. Now y'all know I love an unexplained disappearance. Can't get enough. The Hoyita, or Joyita, was a fishing vessel that disappeared in the South Pacific in 1955, only to later be found drifting around abandoned. The ship was originally built in 1931 as a luxury yacht until it was purchased by the U.S. Navy in 1941 and retrofitted to serve as a patrol boat. It changed hands several more times, having been outfitted with a cork lining and refrigeration to be used as a fishing vessel. At the time of its disappearance, October 1955, it was being used as a charter boat out of Samoa. It left port with 25 people on board and only one functioning engine because the other one broke the previous day. <laughs> there were 16 crew members and 9 passengers, and amongst the passengers was a surgeon. Keep that in mind. Their journey across the Pacific was set to take around two days, and no distress signals were received. But after they were more than a day late for their arrival, the New Zealand Air Force sent out a search and rescue mission, which would prove unsuccessful. Five weeks later, a sighting of the Hoyito was reported 600 miles off its intended course. It was found abandoned, listing to one side, and with its radio tuned to the frequency that was used for distress signals. However, the radio was already in really poor condition prior to the voyage, so its range was really short. The ship itself had moderate damage, and all three of the life rafts were gone. All of the clocks on the ship were stopped at 1025, and the navigating lights were left on, which indicates that whatever happened, happened at night. A lot of the navigation equipment and any firearms that were on board were also missing. The surgeon's medical bag was out on deck, along with a scalpel and some bloody bandages. The engine room was found flooded, with both engines unserviceable and the bilge pump clogged aka the thing that would make it unflooded. The official investigation ended and they could not come up with an explanation. Nobody is really sure why they would leave the boat, because with its cork hull and the multiple empty oil drums on board, it would be essentially unsinkable despite the flooding. So what could have possibly happened that caused them to get in the lifeboats and leave never to be found again? If you've been following along with the iceberg so far, you're going to recognize multiple familiar concepts in this one, so that's fun. Electromagnetism and the paranormal. You'll often hear of electromagnetic radiation being associated with paranormal events in some way or another. It's kind of a chicken or the egg situation. Believers in the paranormal are kind of on the fence. Is the electromagnetic field facilitating the paranormal event? Or is the paranormal event generating the electromagnetic field? Either way, this is why you see paranormal investigators on TV using different EMF devices. The more scientific crowd theorized that electromagnetic energy is affecting the brain and causing hallucinations. The latter have gone as far as to theorize that more paranormal events are reported at night because of the way solar winds interact with the Earth's own magnetic field, depending on which way the Earth is facing towards the sun. Low frequency infrasound caused by like a household appliance can actually have a similar effect. Oh, there's infrasound! You've heard that before! Studies have shown that electromagnetic stimulation to the temporal lobe caused participants to feel a presence. Or maybe feel like they were being stared at? <laughs> and within those studies, it happened to be noted that participants with a more open mindset and a tendency towards New Age spirituality were more likely to report a paranormal event. Sheep goat effect! It's all coming together. Maybe the eyes really are the windows to the soul. Or I like to say the mouth is the front porch to the face, but that saying hasn't really caught on. 
effect on Paku eyes. The term refers to a theory introduced by George Osawa that claims the eyes can reveal a lot about a person's psyche. It kind of draws from the Chinese and Japanese idea of face reading, similar to palm reading. Sanpaku eyes in particular refer to the sclera, or the white part of your eyes. To have the sclera visible under the iris is associated with misfortune, tragedy, and sometimes an early demise. Uh-oh. Osawa claims to have predicted JFK's assassination because of his eyes. Princess Diana had them, along with other famous people such as Amy Winehouse, John Lennon, Jim Morrison, and Audrey Hepburn. And there were a bunch of others, that's just a short list. To have the sclera visible above the iris is indicative of rage, aggression, and a tendency towards violent outbursts. Here's this. Take a drink every time I say the word jetpack. Jetpack man! It's something that appears to be a man piloting an unauthorized jetpack in the skies over LA starting around 2020. Some speculate that it might be a drone decorated to look like a man with a jetpack as opposed to an actual man with a jetpack. <coughs> the FAA suspect that it's a balloon. The first sighting includes multiple airline pilots radioing into the tower at LAX to say they saw a man in a jetpack hovering at around 3,000 feet. The second sighting was reported by an LAPD helicopter, but was suspected to be a Jack Skellington balloon. The rest of the sightings are all pilots having reported seeing the jetpack man somewhere in the airspace over LAX. And obviously, if it's a guy or a drone, it doesn't have any business being that close to an airport. To me, it seems like a lot of sightings for it to all be Jack Skellington balloons. <laughs> like, how many people in the immediate area of LAX are just constantly buying and releasing Jack Skellington balloons? So I'm going to theorize that it's just one person, and they're up to something. There's a mystery for you. Keep an eye out for anything weird in the background of your photos. Uh -huh. The 1972 Grand Canyon Stranger. Now, isn't this just a lovely vacation photo from the Grand Canyon? Now, who is this? Huh? Hmm? Hmm? This comes from one of those spooky Ask Reddit threads, and the poster says that this is their uncle in the early 1970s. The regular guy, not the guy in the bushes. He and his friends thought it would be funny to take photos pretending to fish over the side of the Grand Canyon. They joked around for about 15 minutes, took this photo, and then left. To their knowledge, they were alone. Then they got the film developed. When looking through the photos, they noticed that guy. And I really hope that's vampire makeup or something, and that's not just his face. Rose paler than me. Apparently in the original print, it's pretty clear that he's smirking, but we can't really see that from the scanned version that was posted on Reddit. The original poster says their uncle can be a bit of a jokester, but to this day he swears that it really did happen, and that he's not just pulling our collective leg. Yeah, it's one of those satanic Illuminati Hollywood conspiracy theories. You know the ones. Was Astro World a demonic sacrifice? Y'all might already be familiar with this one just from spending time on the internet. So as you may recall, during Travis Scott's Astro World Music Festival, the crowd rushed the barricade, trampling each other and causing eight deaths and hundreds of injuries. This is a very unfortunate instance of poorly managed crowd control, but this does happen from time to time at things like sporting events, parades, nightclubs. Travis Scott did not stop the performance, which is not cute. So TikTok got real stirred up and started claiming that the entire festival was a guise for a satanic ritual sacrifice. Because we are kind of in a new wave of the satanic panic from the 80s. Oh no, look at my shirt, oh no! These theories tend to revolve around Travis Scott's album artwork and the way the stage area was decorated. There was a lot of fire. As a bit of an edgelord myself, it's kind of funny how these conspiracy theories latch on to artists, celebrities, etc. using you know, occult imagery to be controversial. Controversy keeps your name relevant. Kind of like when I go on TikTok and act really stupid and people believe it and I get millions of views from it. Who bombed the 1939 World's Fair? Dawn of a New Day was the theme for the 1939-1940 World's Fair in New York City. And I'm sure we know what else was going on around that time over in Europe. On July 4th, 1940, Detective Joseph Lynch received a call about a suspicious package spotted at the World's Fair. An unattended satchel had been discovered in the maintenance area of the British Pavilion. Fair officials removed the audibly ticking package to a less populated area behind the Poland Pavilion to wait for the rudimentary bomb squad consisting of Joseph Lynch and his partner Ferdinand Socha. Big emphasis on rudimentary. 
When Lynch went to cut the bag open with a pocket knife, the bomb detonated, killing him and his partner, as well as injuring several NYPD officers in the area. After questioning numerous groups of varying political affiliations, the suspicion fell on a group of Nazi sympathizers who had been responsible for several recent bombings. They had been threatening to blow up the Brooklyn Bridge. Nothing was ever proven, though. But there is another theory. That the whole thing was a setup by Britain to go ahead and drag the US into the war. Because how else did that bag end up in a maintenance area with restricted access in a heavily guarded exhibit? And I mean, the crown jewels and the Magna Carta were on display levels of heavily guarded. However, much bigger news regarding the war was flooding newspapers, so the bombing was essentially forgotten. Aside from resulting in an immediate upgrade in safety equipment and protocols for bomb squads. It's the 7th century equivalent to napalm with a super secret recipe that has since been lost to time. Greek fire was an incendiary weapon employed by the Eastern Roman Empire, particularly in naval battles. They didn't call themselves Greek, but everyone else did, so it was a whole thing. It consisted of an unspecified flammable compound that would stay lit even on the surface of the water, as well as a device that was used to disperse the substance. Other empires at the time had similar weapons that were all colloquially referred to as Greek fire by the Crusaders. But what the Byzantine Empire had was in a league all its own. It was such a closely guarded secret that we can still only make guesses as to its components. Suspected ingredients include plant resins, quicklime, petroleum products, sulfur, and nitrogen compounds. Or phosphine that was made by boiling animal bones in urine. Don't try this at home. According to records, they had devised some sort of pressurized nozzle that made it the first flamethrower, essentially. There is no shortage of legends about creepy things in the woods, so here's another one. It's not hard to gather from the name that Flesh Gates are a bastardized version of a well-known Navajo legend about an entity you aren't really supposed to talk about. Think of some synonyms for the words flesh and gate. Don't worry, you'll get there. Just to be clear, we're talking about the Flesh Gate version, and we're going to leave the other thing alone out of respect for indigenous culture. When people refer to something online by the other name, they are most likely talking about Flesh Gates. The Flesh Gate is essentially a shapeshifter that can mimic the voice and appearance of different people and animals in order to lure their prey, you, out into the woods. So you're a deceased relative calling out to you from the tree line, but the tone and cadence of their voice is all wrong. Maybe don't go out there. Or if your disheveled neighbor who was reported missing weeks ago suddenly shows up on your porch at night wanting to show you something out in the woods, it maybe refrain. According to witnesses who claim to have seen the flesh gate in its natural form, it sounds a lot like our good buddy the crawler. You know, tall, pale, lanky, etc. It does sometimes incorporate the whole don't whistle at night thing. Would you open a cursed vault for untold riches? Padma Nabhaswami Temple is a Hindu temple located in Kerala, India. It was built around the 16th century and dedicated to Lord Vishnu. Beneath the temple are six vaults filled with gold and jewels, but only five of them have been opened. And legend has it that there is a curse placed on the temple, and opening the final vault would anger Lord Vishnu as well as the serpent deities that are guarding it. In addition to all of the snake imagery on that door, there is also a giant statue in the temple of Vishnu reclining on a snake. And this is not entirely related, but it's cool, so I wanted to show you anyway. The temple was built so that on the equinox, the setting sun lines up with these windows. Anyway, here are some instances of the curse in action. Trespassers attempting to break into the vault were bitten by cobras. A local politician who spearheaded a campaign to catalog all the contents of the temple passed away one month into the project. And the mother of one of the team members working on the project passed away as well. It is also said that you can hear the sound of crashing waves lapping at the inside of the sealed door. Do you want to go in there? Because I don't think I do. There's a beach in Canada with a disembodied foot problem. Since 2007, 21 human feet have washed up on the shores of the Salish Sea outside Vancouver. Don't you just love that it's an odd number? Yeah, most of the feet were not matching sets. The first thing that would come to mind would be a serial killer with, I guess, the exact opposite of a foot fetish. But that's been pretty much ruled out. For the real answer, we turn to science. And if you're squeamish, this is a good time to tap out. Let's learn about what happens to a corpse in the ocean. It sinks and the fish will have a feast. Th this is a whale, not a people. There are certain body parts that they prefer over others, and the ankles usually end up gnawed off. And then the lightweight foam sole of the shoe causes the feet to rise to the surface. 
and the natural flow of the tides carries the feet and deposits them in approximately the same area every time. DNA testing has linked the majority of the feet to missing persons cases. But this leg phenomena has actually been going on a lot longer than people initially realized. There is a spot in Vancouver called Leg in Boot Square where a disembodied leg was found in 1887. Because obviously you need to commemorate that. Here's a map of the feet locations, by the way. 